This is important. This was the reason Biden wanted him at USDA, Chip. What you hear on legislative proposals for climate change, I think is mostly noise. Hey, good morning. It's Monday morning, and it is time to launch into the new DC signal to noise. I'm Chip Flory on my maiden run <laughs> as a as an official part of Signal to Noise, and I'll be here with you every week to pry as much info out of Wiesmeyer as I possibly can. You guys know Jim. He's the pro farmer policy analyst. And for those of you that don't know our history together, Jim and I have worked together for more than 30 years. Uh, we were basically partners on pro farmer newsletter for half of that time. So Jim, I'm looking forward to this. You know, I said it's the new DC signal to noise. That might be a bit of a stretch. We're going <laughs> to stick with the old format for the most part. Absolutely. And we'll, bo and we'll continue to give the signal uh, on some issues that we see coming down the pike and most of the noise as well, Chip. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, just real briefly, we are going to make a few changes here. And I've been a, a, a big fan of signal to noise from the very beginning. And the recap and the look back at, at the, the major issues that were coming out of D.C. In the, in the week that was wrapping up when, when uh, Signal to Noise was done on Friday afternoons, it, it was so important. And it was such a great update over the weekend to, to really get us ready for the week ahead. Well, why can't we do that on Monday morning, do a recap of what happened the previous week, and take a look at some of the issues that develop over the weekend that will be setting the stage and will be so important for the week ahead. And that's what we're going to be doing on the Monday morning edition of DC Signal to Noise. So I'm looking forward to that. Jim, with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and recap some of the big things that happened last week. And, and very close to the top of the list has got to be the American uh, Jobs Act, the infrastructure bill, whatever you want to call it. It really took a lot of airspace last week. It did, and it'll continue to take airspace, uh, you know, this week, Chip, uh, when Biden, uh, before a joint session of Congress uh, Wednesday evening, talks about this and his other spending uh, initiatives. But <clears throat> last week, we had House Transportation and Infrastructure uh, Chairman Peter DeFazio from Oregon. He said he wants to mark up his infrastructure bill by late May. Now, the signal that I'm getting there, Chip, is along with the White House, they want this transportation uh, bill completed as soon as possible because Biden does not want to delay the spending on this initiative. Now, we also have the Republicans offering counter proposals of nearly $600 billion. And then over the weekend uh, on the news program, Fox News, we had a key senator uh, offer up to a $900 billion you know, counter offer. Bottom line, Chip, I think this is uh, increasing the odds that we'll eventually see either a standalone uh, uh, infrastructure bill or one tied to other initiatives. Okay, this, for the first time, we're seeing some willingness from Republican leadership to have a conversation with the White House about some of these issues, some of these very important issues. And it's um, we're coming up on Biden's first uh, his his hundredth day in office. And it feels like some of the cooperation between the two parties, maybe maybe it's just wishful thinking here, Jim, but it feels like it's starting to come back. Well, at least on this issue, because there's one reason. Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat moderate from West Virginia, he's more allying with the Republicans in relative on infrastructure of saying you must work with the Republicans on this one and let's keep it as close as possible to actual infrastructure issues, Chip. So, okay. you know, they actually got the signal from the White House. They aren't going to get this without Joe Manchin. Okay. Yeah, it's very important uh, to really keep in perspective just how important he is to the process across the board here. Um, let, let's move on and talk a little bit about some of the climate issues out there because the Green New Deal came back powerfully. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, the Green New Deal is one of those pieces of legislation or a concept, a plan, a proposal that uh, 
is is my opinion it's more aspirational than than it is uh realistic i guess in many cases but jim <laughs> we continue to see a push that that for the the proposals that are in there Oh, in, in spades, Chip. Uh, your signal is right. It is more if come aspirational. Yeah. And frankly, this, the, the, I think it's mostly noise because reason we had the, you know, Biden had a leadership co you know, conference of, of yes. world leaders uh, last week, you know, virtually. And when you bottom line what he wants for this country, over the past few years, Americans through fracking, uh, natural gas, et cetera, we have lowered our emissions 12 to 15 percent based on the last few years, where countries like China, Russia, uh, India, Africa have increased theirs. And when you look at Biden's goal of reducing uh, emissions uh, by 50 to 52 percent, let's put perspective on that. That would be three times the level that we've already done that 12 to 15% over the last few years. It's just not going to happen right. because of the fundamental changes short term that would need to take place to even have a chance to meet those commitments. Now that's, that doesn't mean we shouldn't d do some things, but not the, dr the draconian measures that would be needed to right. meet that 50 to 52% assessment. Jim, was there anything, were there any real signals that came, of the Biden leadership conference uh, on on uh, climate. I mean, it, the coverage that I've seen it, it certainly suggests that that there was a lot of conversation with no real solutions per, even even suggested. Well, the clear signal I got out of it came from China saying, "Don't expect us to uh, decrease as much as you you know want us to." That was the the you know biggest signal I got. And behind the scenes, Chip, what you're hearing in Washington is uh, all this may be you know uh, hard to get, but the Biden administration and the Democrats can do a lot regulatory wise. Example that that agriculture is already nervous about a border tax. On, on countries that don't fulfill the initiatives of what Biden's group feels for, you know, climate change proposals. So they can do that uh, uh, administratively. Yeah. And border taxes turn into retaliation and uh, can bog down trade as we go forward. So it's something that obviously we're going to have to watch very closely. Uh, on, on agriculture and the climate, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack got very involved in the process last week and has got some some big ideas on how he can help make progress with the use of the CRP. Yes, uh, he wants to really ramp up CRP by offering uh, you know, higher rental rates eventually and bonuses, incentives, if you will. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but this just follows the 2018 farm bill that went the other direction. Yeah. Let me give you the signal I heard. Why you, This is important, why Vilsack is leading the charge for agriculture. This was the reason Biden wanted him at USDA, Chip, because... White House people tell me they saw Vilsack as the only Democrat that could have a chance of convincing the ag sector to go along with some of the climate change proposals. Somebody like Marsha Fudge would not, who wanted the job, would right. not have been able to convince, you know, the uh, ag sector. At least Vilsack has a chance. Wow, ah, that's uh, that, that's interesting. That that. Um that the Biden administration believes that Vilsack can have that much potential or have that much pull influence yes. with, uh, with the farming community out here. And you know what? I think he does have a fair number of fans, I guess you could call them uh, out in the farming community. So maybe they will follow along. Uh, this, uh, the CRP came after we got some, some additional information. Well, I, you know what? Additional information really isn't the, the right way to say it. There's more questions being asked about Biden's 30, 30, 30 by 30 plan. And we're looking for those details and, and uh, the anxiety level is ramping up already. 
Yeah, this is much like the uh, WOTUS rule under the Obama administration, that rumors of it uh, led to high anxiety. And once we saw the actual language, it was fulfilled uh, anxiety, Chip. And the Farm Bureau uh, you know, put out a letter. They want details. So they're leading the charge on this. Let's see where you want to go on this, Mr. President, his 30, you know, his 30 by 30 goal to, to reduce uh, I mean, to increase conservation uh, on on lands uh, by you know thirty percent by twenty thirty. Uh, some states uh, that initially was led by Nebraska uh, are very very nervous about this. So they also led the charge on this, of saying, "Wait a minute, where where are you going here?" So Vilsack and others in the Biden administration need to define. Uh, what they mean by this, because uh, right now it's just a thunderous, you know, negative uh, uh, attitudes on the part of many. Now, the 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 uh, strident environmentalist, the activist, they actually say he's not doing enough relative to uh, conservation and on that, uh, you know, Green New Deal. They want him to do more. Yeah. And when you have those two sides, uh, Chip, at co in conflict like that, that usually means nothing will get done. Okay. Okay. Um, staying on the environmental, the climate issues here for a bit, biofuels, ethanol, uh, biodiesel, renewable diesel, they all seem to be, the momentum is behind those fuels for what they can do uh, to to help reduce GHG emissions until we get more of the consumer fleet over to electric vehicles because that's where everybody says but that's where we're going. I don't know if I completely agree with that or not, but the environmental benefits of those biofuels becoming a bigger and bigger part of the story, Jim. Uh oh, absolutely. And biofuel proponents, their lobbyists are getting smarter, Chip. They're seeing, they want EPA to replace uh, what what one trade organization called the uh, outdated and, and confusing labels for E15. They want uh, biofuels, uh, both ethanol, biodiesel, and other biofuels to be a significant part of this movement toward climate change uh, reform. You've got some Democrat, key Democrats on board, uh, you know, Cindy uh, Axney from uh, Iowa is urging congressional leaders to consider biofuel investments and incentives as part of Biden's uh, infrastructure you know, proposal. So you can see the linkages uh, here. Plus, you have Secretary Tom Vilsack on the side of the biofuel industry on this one. So uh, that's his plus side that he knows not only coming, uh, you know, uh, you know, former Iowa governor and a former, you know, USDA secretary under under President Obama, he knows the the uh, you know positive impacts of biofuel. So the signal I'm getting is uh, ethanol is being listened to uh, on this particular issue because it's got a story to tell. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, let's get something in here for the dairy guys, because this food box program has been such an important, uh, it's had so much influence over what's happening in the dairy markets over the past 12 months, 14 months. What's the, what's the latest on the on the food box. Program. Well, d dairy will have their own donation program. Uh, you know, Vilsack made sure of that. But really, you know, the bottom line that I have on this, uh, it, it was just pure politics on the part of Vilsack and the Biden administration to, quote, do away with the food box uh, program. They're really not going to do away with that food box program. They're rearranging the chairs, calling it different things. But I don't think you're going to see much of a pullback from the positive impacts of you know donating a lot of good U.S. food and and dairy products, you know, to the uh, needy uh, Americans, it was just politics on a name change, Jeff. Okay, all right, very good. I'm going to use this topic uh, to kind of wrap up our look back and launch us into the look ahead for the week, Jim. And that is all the supply side issues. Okay. Uh, you look at the at uh, what's going on in India right now with with the COVID nineteen surge. Uh, there's some concern that what is happening in India could actually have an impact on the supply of generic medications coming into the United States. 
uh, you look at at the disruptions that we've seen at, uh, on the supply chain from from car parts to you know it 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 seems to be impacting everything right now. Huge disruption on the supply chain. Is there going to be an investigation into what is going on? Is there going to be an effort to rebuild a domestic supply chain? Well, you're going to have a lot of looks back, so I'll tell you that. Now, mm. now the, one of the key things that I saw last week that was really not uh, reported that much, Chip, is uh, the Biden administration uh, through Congress is putting at least $500 million in a study to avoid future pandemics. Uh, they they, they, they uh, are funding a center uh, so, it's, so we'll have early planning on starting to build the, they call it the national center, you know, center for epidemic forecasting and outbreak analytics. Uh, only Washington can come up with that long term, mm -hmm. but it, it, it was created by the CDC, you know, center for disease control and prevention. I like things like this because we were caught totally unaware on this pandemic and you don't want it to uh, see it ahead. Right. But, I, you know, I really thought you were going on the, well, on the supply disruptions, uh, they are clearly beginning to signal inflation ahead, but the Federal Reserve keeps saying it's transitory. And we're gonna know this Wednesday oh, at the end of the, of the current Federal Open Market Committee, you know, meeting, uh, FOMC, whether or not the Fed's uh, changing their tune. Uh, I don't have to tell you and your listeners for Agritalk, uh, soybeans are up, what, over $1 or more from a week ago? You know, right. the corn right. market is inverted. It has a carry while wheat doesn't. Uh, December wheat, 695 versus corn, 546, you know? Wow. And the attache in China forecast uh, record uh, corn imports from China. Maybe the yep. Rip Van Winkle USDA World Board will take heed to that one. And uh, pro farmer sources say China recently bought three to four million tons of new crop corn. And now we have Traders King off Brazil's second corn crop. It's going down. Here's the bottom line on the inflation that's really going to take off in agriculture, Chip. This is what the best thinkers are telling me. USDA's estimate of uh, Brazil's second corn crop, I you know, forget what you call it, Safrina? Safrina. Yeah. Is at 100 and, 109. Right. The best sources uh, I have in the marketplace outside of Pro Farmer are telling me they're focusing on how low it could go. A growing number are around 104 million metric tons. The closer that gets to 100 or even below, you're going to have an explosive market and trade policy impacts where a number of countries uh, uh, are going to put uh, some, some tempering of their exports, Chip. And while Brazil doesn't usually tap on their exports, uh, you, you initially watch their ethanol policy. So I wanted to bring this up because not just agriculture, food prices are going to go up. I, I think that's a clear signal here. You have a host of other you know, commodities, lumber, housing prices, uh, metal prices, et cetera, are on the rise. And I think that the Federal Reserve is overplaying their hand. I think we're going to have to deal with inflation far sooner than people think right now. Okay, so what does that mean? They deal with inflation far soon. How are they going to deal with it? Is, are we going to see actual Fed-driven increases in interest rates? Uh, yes, uh, but you, you're first here. You, you'll first see that later this year. They'll have to give the market an advanced signal, and, and many, you know, a Bloomberg survey I saw over the weekend signaled that that will come late this fall or by the end of December of this year. Now that will initially come chip in the T-bills that they buy to keep long-term interest rates lower. They won't increase interest rates this calendar year, but I think sometime they're coming next year. Look what that has for carryover impacts on the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have some smart thinkers. Remember earlier this year, you had almost everybody forecasting a lower trending dollar. That was the time to buy the dollar because we've trended higher.
Yeah. Now, these same people are saying the dollar will continue higher, maybe about three more percentage points between now and the end of the year, because we're going to be the first major developed country to start raising interest rates. Interesting. Okay. Um, we, we've got big plans. There are high dollar amounts on these bills being uh, tossed around out in D.C. Jim, how are we going to pay for it? Isn't that going to be a major topic of discussion in the week ahead? This town doesn't care about uh, it. I call it modern, modern monetary spending. Yeah. Both groups, Chip, are throwing money at it. And it looks to me like Biden, I've been told that Biden handles his either opponents or groups within the, the usual Democratic circle, if they're raising some questions, throw money at them. I, I mean, just think, we had a $1.9 trillion COVID, COVID, in quotes, aid package, then that was followed by the $2.25 trillion infrastructure package, uh, 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 well, jobs package, and now we're talking about about a billion and a half infrastructure counter you know, uh, yeah, on the uh, uh, um, infrastructure package that he'll unveil Wednesday. That, that's a chunk of change uh, out there. It's unbelievable, Jim. It's it's absolutely unbelievable the amount of spending that we're looking at. And I know that you say that they don't care about how we're going to pay for it all, but these the the, the tax plans that are out there, Jim, obviously has has raised some concern in farm country there as well. And you know what? I shouldn't say just farm country because the the estate plans or estate tax plans and everything that affects small businesses outside of farming as well. And and hopefully people understand that. Yes, what I said, they don't care. Maybe too strong. However, uh, Biden knows that he wants to hit the ground more than running. He's flying because he knows that he's got about a year and a half from his first day in office to get fundamental changes done to, as he sees it for the U.S. Uh, you know, government and U.S. economy. Uh, even in the transportation sector, you have Republicans saying, well, maybe a quarter of this can won't have to be offset with spending uh, you know, cuts elsewhere. You have a bipartisan group in the House late last week, it broke Friday as we were on AgriTalk, uh, uh, saying that they would be amenable to, to a gas tax uh, increase. So I'm starting to see a signal to, to a change in that. It's called user fees. Don't call it a tax. Call it a user fees. And then you have uh, uh, Senator Rob Portman, Repu moderate Republican from Ohio, who's uh, not going to run for re-election. So you always listen to someone who's not going to run for re-election. He said over the weekend that he thinks the user fee should also apply to uh, those people like himself who either have hybrid cars or electric vehicles because they use the transportation sector as well. So we're beginning to see a movement chip toward some offsets to this tremendous spending. I want a bottom line here. We need to do uh, trillions of dollars in investments in our in, in our transportation sector that has served so well to the U.S. ag sector over the decades. Yes, yeah, absolutely, and and there there does seem to be bipartisan support for it. It's just a question of which plan we're going to take and how it's going to be um, how it's going to be advanced. It's going to have to be broken up, isn't it, Jim? I think so. And then what what Biden wants to do that is uh, really not infrastructure, but still part of his bill that he'll talk about, his proposal that he'll talk about Wednesday evening, they can do that under budget reconciliation. Uh, still controversial, Chip, but I think if they're smart, there's a consensus to do Pure infrastructure, what what we historically have known, roads, bridges, waterway, our great waterway systems, uh, et cetera, bridges, et cetera, and then get that locked in. And it can be higher. Actually, the Republican proposal, even at $600 billion, when you look at what they want to spend on transportation, it's more than the Biden people want to spend on similar aspects of infrastructure. 
So I think once you realize that, the Republicans would say, ooh, let's get a, a huge down payment on this. And for these other more social aspects of infrastructure that are controversial, let's roll that into a you know, uh, you know uh, a reconciliation bill where, where we'll only need 51, you know, senators right. to approve it. Right, right. Okay, only about five minutes left here, Jim. Let's sure. take a look at the last week of April coming up. And and uh, what are some of the, the key events, issues that you're going to be paying closest attention to? Well, the, of course, from a crop perspective, we, we have to see, you know, how the planning progress or lack thereof is going in the U.S. We have to continue to monitor Brazil uh, as far as their second crop. Uh, from a trade aspect, we need to see whether or not Ch China, wh whether the sources are correct that China continues to buy, in this case, uh, new crop corn. We'll have to see whether or not USDA goes along with that assessment, so we'll have tighter carry over. And then we'll see the uh, more proof that the Democrats want to get this uh, infrastructure bill done, I think, before the 4th of July, Chip. And that's what I'm watching about in, in the in the month ahead. Inflation, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, signals, uh, crop signals, not only here, but around the world. And, uh, you know, China's ferocious appetite for corn and other grains. Okay. What has... What, if you were going to give us a warning for the week ahead and say, watch out for this one, this is going to be all noise and no signal, what might you look at and say, you, you, you got to be careful with this one? Well, what I want to see what they're going to do uh, on this climate change, because I've never seen a whole of government approach on any issue other than a war issue, Chip, in, in my lifetime. And what they can do uh, regulatory wide, uh, wide is, uh, is, is expansive on here. Uh, I w but what you hear on other aspects, such as 30 by 30, I think it's going to be mostly noise. What you hear on legislative proposals for climate change, I think is mostly noise for the reasons I said before. It just doesn't work out on paper. What, it's easy to sell concepts in climate change, but once the American people see the, imp the consequences, the impacts in their daily life, on getting to that 50 to 52% reduction in emissions, that's when the administration will get the signal that this is undoable. Yeah, interesting. All right, Jim. Um, hey, we're going to wrap it up. That is our first Monday morning edition of DC Signal to Noise. I'm AgriTalk host Chip Flory. That is Pro Farmer Policy Analyst Jim Wiesmeyer encouraging you all, you all to cut down on the noise. Let's get more signals. We'll talk to you next week.